Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Project 4 overview uh, for ECE 3311 Principles of Communication Systems. So uh, in this short video, um, I'm going to be going through a little bit about what is involved with respect to Project 4, which uh, focuses on you know, the, the ever lovely topic of phase lock loops. Um, this was actually a particularly difficult um, project to set up. Um, first of all, it's the first time that um, both myself and my students have set something up like this in uh, Python. So in the past, it's always been offered in uh, MATLAB. So, uh, you know, and even there, um, the MATLAB examples were, were quite difficult. Um, even though they're very, they look relatively sort of straightforward to implement, phase lock loops are actually um, a very fancy way of doing a communication, uh, control theory applied to communication systems. It, what you're effectively doing is you're trying to establish a lock on something that's time varying and then be able to track it, all right? So given that premise, okay, uh, the code that uh, all of you will be uh, using, okay, uh, uses some uh, slightly more fancier blocks that are from a, a very widely used um, uh, open source environment called GNU Radio, which is primarily used, it's almost exclusively used in the software-defined radio community. That, that's a community I subscribe to with respect to implementing communication systems in hardware. All right. So what we'll do is we're going to go through the project handout. I'm going to give kind of like along the way some very important pointers uh, with respect to uh, how this works. Because uh, again, I just want to make sure that everybody's on the right page. Um, the, uh, and everybody understands the blocks that are involved with respect to um, this project. And of course, feel free to email me or Slack me um, or Kartik uh, to, for any help, like if you're stuck or anything like that. Um, we'll, we'll be more than happy to help. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so you should have this in Canvas, all right? And uh, what you'll see is, like, you know, what are the project objectives? So first of all, uh, understand how a phase lock loop works. <laughs> and by the end of this project, you'll definitely learn how phase lock loop works. Okay. So again, don't don't be deceived by the fact that it's a, it looks like a short handout and it's only one topic. It's a very challenging topic. Okay, so the sooner you get on this, the better. Um, specifically, what we're going to be looking at is one type of PLL. Okay, that's shorthand for phase lock loop, which is called the Costas loop. We saw this earlier on in this course. And um, uh, this is going to be the phase lock loop that, of choice that we'll be using in this course uh, for, for enabling lock on things like the carrier frequency offset, right? And uh, we're going to be using the GNU radio block that, um, that implements the phase lock, uh, this, this particular phase lock loop, this costless loop. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to be, the hard part is you're not going to be implementing the costless loop from scratch. No, you're going to get a block and that block is the costless loop. But the trick is the parameters for, for defining the phase lock loop, the, the, the costless loop, in order to get the lock of the signal you're trying to track. And so there's quite a bit of theory behind that. And, and I summarize this here a little bit with respect to the, um, the project handout, okay? So as usual, there's going to be a Jupyter Notebook, which I'm going to be going through on my Linux computer on this side here. So I'm going to be sharing some of that. Um, and you can open in VS Code or whatever sort of Python environment uh, that you feel comfortable with. There's also three mystery files. And those three mystery files, um, um, I, I would like you to lock onto and figure out what the heck those things are. So again, more tweedling of of the of the parameters for the phase lock loop. So it's called mystery signal one, mystery signal two, mystery signal three dot NPY. You might say, what the heck is NPY? NumPy has its own file format that you can save information in, and you can also read into the NumPy, uh, using NumPy commands already as a NumPy array. So it's very convenient instead of like saving it as a text file or any other sort of uh, format that's a little bit more trickier to decode. So NumPy files, great, you'll be using it, relatively straightforward to do. Um, so uh, what you're gonna need to do for this project. So, so again, you're gonna be using, I like using this French term, pré-à-porter. Um, this means ready to wear. In this case, you'll be using off-the-shelf, Costas loop commands 
okay, from the GNU radio environment, right? Um, so very, very super duper important. What you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to install GNU radio. We did not pre-install this on your 3311 disk image. So you're gonna need to use, run the command sudo apt install GNU radio. So this is gonna, it's gonna take a little bit of time. It's gonna, it's like, you're gonna see all these things whizzing by your screen and like, you know, install a bunch of stuff and there's gonna be a status bar that slowly goes from left to right. But at the end of the day, you're gonna get GNU radio installed on your PCs, right? So once you do that, okay, you should, you should be ready to roll. If there's any issues with that, you know, please send us a, a Slack message to, to ask us what the heck is going on. I'm getting this error, that error. I tried it out on your disk image, um, like, you know, the exact same image that you're using. I am tried it out, totally fine, should work. So unless there's something weird that happened uh, with your disk image, uh, everything should be good to go, all right? So run that command, and then we can get started with executing, um, uh, the GNU radio commands in, in the PNY, in the, the Jupyter Notebook. But before that, I do want to go through, again, a little bit of a primer about how phase lock loops work. Okay, so phase lock loops, as I mentioned before, in class, okay, several lectures, what it does is it tries to lock on to um, the phase of an incoming signal that you do not know. Maybe you know what the carrier frequency is approximately, but you don't know what the phase is. It's random, it's out there, it's spinning away. And this makes it very impossible actually to be able to extract any sort of information because without any phase lock, um, you can't really properly demodulate your signal, right? So this is a critical, critical, critical process with respect to being able to demodulate any intercepted signal, right? Even if you know what the frequency is, that's great. But if you don't know what the phase is, or if there's a carrier frequency offset, not so good. So you're gonna to need to use a PLL, right? And figure one is kind of that generic PLL diagram that we saw in class, right? So, and the way it works is you have the intercepted signal and you have a reference signal here that's produced by something called a VCO or voltage controlled oscillator. What the phase uh, detector does, right, is it, it, what, it, what it tries to do is it tries to extract out what that difference is in phase and frequency and whatnot between reference, the V naught of T, and the incoming signal, V in of T, to produce V1 of T. Now, the loop filter is critical because the loop filter, which is a low pass filter, tries to peel out the phase term while extracting out uh, every other sort of component that is the result of the phase detector. So the phase detector, what it does is it smushes together v, Vn and V0. Um, in the simplest form, when we saw the analog PLL, what it does is it multiplies the two, right? And suppose they're both sinusoidal signals, some beautiful trig identities kick in, we're gonna have a DC term and we're gonna have some higher frequency terms. The loop filter extracts out the higher frequency terms, okay? And then, the output V2 of T, okay, is going to be some sort of uh, sinusoidal signal based on, okay, that phase difference. And then that, so now you have an amplitude value, okay, that, that is uh, equal to that phase difference, which is great because that's what drives the VCO, okay? And that VCO, depending on what that phase is, will either increase the periodicity, right, uh, of, of the output, which is V naught of T, or decrease it, and it'll try and match that of Vn. So this, as you can see, is actually a quite a complicated control problem, right? Okay. Now, um, the Costas loop, we saw this in class, okay? So um, this, is, this is the Costas loop, okay? A little bit more detail. Uh, but basically what we saw in the course in the class, right? So what we got is we have Vn, again, we assume to be some sort of sinusoid, right? And then what we have here, it's multiplied by an in-phase and quadrature component, right? It's multiplied by the top branch, which is another cosine, same frequency, we hope, ballpark, plus a phase difference, theta e. And uh, in the bottom branch, it's multiplied by its 90 degrees phase shifted version, which is a quadrature component 
um, omega CT, same frequency, and also same error. So what it does is we have a cosine times a cosine. We have a trig identity for that. We have a cosine times a sine. We have a trig identity for that. And the low pass filter, again, extracts out, uh, extracts out, it keeps the DC term, which should be a phase value, should be theta E, and extracts out everything else. So what we get at the end of the day is V1 of T. It's going to be this phase term, the phase error term. There's also the message signal, M of T, right? But this is where things differ. Uh, we take the top branch and bottom branch, multiply them together. So what happens when you multiply cos A sine A? Well, what we get is V3 of T, which is going to be uh, sine, um, uh, what is it going to be? Sine 2 theta E, right? And we also have uh, M T squared. So this is the critical part. So what happens is this here, this uh, LPF3, so when we talk about loop filters, this LPF1 and this LPF2 are not the loop filters, okay? The loop filter is actually LPF3. So when any, whenever anybody says, hey, do you know what the loop filter bandwidth is for the Casas loop? It's not LPF1, it's not LPF2, it's LPF3. That's the important one. Why is it important? So this is why it's important. I kind of briefly mentioned it in the lecture, but let me really emphasize this here. Okay. That's cosine. That's a sine. Okay. 90 degrees phase shifter comes from the same VC VCO. So what happens here, we have a cos, cos A, cos B. And that's gonna be equal to what? Cos A plus B plus cos A minus B. Here, we have a cos A sine B. And what's that equal to? Just to make sure, because I always forget trig identity. Here we go. Ah, yes, yes. Oh, yep. Yeah. This sucker here, if I get it right is sine, sine A plus B minus sine A minus B, okay? And then the low pass filter, so remember, this is not the loop filter. Low pass filter one, low pass filter two, extracts out, because when you, do, when you apply these things, right, this, this fella here is gonna produce a double frequency term. Same thing here. The loop, the loop filters, uh, these low pass filters are going to extract it out. So, what we end up getting at the output of these things is we're going to get A, M of T, cos, and then what we're left with is theta E, and same thing here A, M of T, sine, theta E. And then that. Okay, Get mul gets multiplied together. Okay, so at, at the end of the day, what we get is we get cos A sine A. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, doop doop. So when we get that, 
Mm-hmm. What we when we when we get that? Ah, yes, 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 yes. We get half. The trigon entity is half sine two a. So what we we get is a squared m t squared sine two times the phase. So this loop filter is very, very important. So that's the loop filter. Okay, that's also a low-pass filter. So why is it important? So here, here's why it's important. So what happens is this loop filter, okay, which is low-pass filter. So we're feeding in So here, this is slow moving, it's constant almost, okay? So that's not varying too much. Okay, this is. So what we wanna do is we wanna smooth. So all we want our VCO to do, right, here, we want the VCO to lock on the face, and we want to smooth out any variations that are going into the VCO. What we ideally want is we want some sort of constant sign. So we want this to either be constant or close to a constant, such that it doesn't influence too much the VCO input, right? So the way to do it is if, let's say, now m squared, so that's gonna be somewhat varying, time varying. What the loop filter does is it smooths out any variations such all you get is the sine of two theta e. So that's the goal of the loop filter here, okay? That's why its bandwidth is critical. You gotta choose a bandwidth that's capable of smoothing out um, everything such that at the end of the day, all you're left with is that beautiful sign, and whatever is multiplied by it is effectively treated like a constant or close to it. All right. So, so that's really the rationale behind the structure there, and that's why it's a very critical element. There are two critical elements. So the first one of that loop filter is the loop filter bandwidth, because the more narrow the loop filter bandwidth is, okay, it will reject all but the lowest frequencies. Okay, that's good, because if you keep the really low frequencies, all right, there's actually two things. Okay, that loop filter, I'm gonna read it from left to right here. Okay, so the first thing is, we're gonna have the loop filter bandwidth. Okay, and what that does is this will reject all but lowest frequencies. Okay, so, so what that effectively does is, um, as an example, like an aside, this might not be the actual case, but imagine you had a signal that looked like, like this. If you pass it through a low-pass filter, what, what, you, what it will do is it's gonna try and smooth. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's not gonna immediately follow and track. It's gonna, it's gonna decay slowly and take out the high frequency terms and only keep some sort of like mean, mean value. Now, this is kind of a really bad example, but, but what it will do, maybe a better, actually, here's a better example. Chuck, see, this is what happens when I'm trying to draw. So um, here's one. What the loop filter is going to do is it's going to ignore the high frequency terms and only trace kind of like what the, the overall DC bias is, if you want to use electrical speed. So at the end of the day, what you get is something that looks like this. Okay, beautiful. Now, there's a second term, very, very, very important. 
So the second term is something called a damping factor. So it's represented by zeta and it's called the damping factor. And this too is very important because this describes that loop filter behavior of, uh, of again, like, you know, how much do we dampen by, um, uh, you know, the sort of the transient response of that low pass filter. Um, like, is it a box car or is it like a lot smoother? So we don't have any abrupt transitions, okay? So these two, and this is what you're gonna have to select for this project, is the loop filter bandwidth and the damping factor. And they're all gonna be different for different applications as you'll find out. Uh, sadly, it might even be a little too difficult. <laughs> no, just kidding, it's gonna be fine. But it, it will be a challenge. You're gonna find out, oh, don't do this, do that. But it's all gonna go back to here. This thing here. This LPF and that LPF, they're not loop filters. Okay, they have one mission, and that's to remove the double frequency term. But this loop filter is very critical. It's to smooth out everything from V3T, such that the VCO can produce okay, the necessary um, you know, so cosine and sine to establish a lock on the input that's coming in. Now, the theory, if you really want to go into um, like the theory and treat this like a control system, Whew. Um, that, that, there is definitely some literature out there, okay? So, um, so I gave some math here to show how this is all described at the end of the day, right? So here's the damping factor. Um, uh, damping factor less than one is called underdamp. Over one is over, uh, is, uh, over, over damp. And then equal to one is critically damp. And, and again, you might want to start off, this is a suggestion, of a damping factor equal to 0 0.707. That's kind of what folks in industry use in terms of a starting point. And then you might want to fiddle with it one way or another in order to perfect it. And then with the, um, the bandwidth, again, narrow, narrow is pretty good, right? And we, we give a suggestion in, in the, in the uh, Jupyter notebook for you folks to try out. But in terms of where this theory comes from, yeah, um, there are several references. Okay, so first of all, here's GNU Radio, in case you want to know more about GNU Radio. But these three references describe uh, Costas loop theory, right? So Feigen here, actually, surprisingly, um, is a WPI alum. Woo! And he wrote a really cool paper in RF signal processing in January 2002 that, in particular, GNU Radio sites, and you can find it online, right? And this describes, to some extent, how a Costas loop works in practice. Best here, Roland Best and his collaborators here, came up with a very control-focused type of tutorial on a Costas loop. And yeah, it's really insane. It has a lot of references to Laplace transforms and stuff. So if you're into that sort of stuff, great reference. And then lastly, this is what I really kind of helped me understand the way of presenting the Costas loop in this project is um, the MS thesis from Meta. And this is from Missouri University of Science and Technology. So it was a pretty good reference. I would definitely recommend checking it out, okay? So with that, let's switch gears. Let's go into, uh, into the actual project itself. So first of all, um, there's basic experimentation, there's time varying phase, and then there are mystery files. So it's really what this project is. The first, the basic experimentation is, here's a constant phase, right? It's QPSK signal, find the phase value, right? Use a Costas loop, find, a, like, and the thing is, the nice thing here is, um, like, uh, once you get a lock, you got a lock. So, awesome sauce. So, uh, here, uh, what you'll need to do, and let's, let's switch gears. So, let's, let's stop sharing. Mm, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to turn it over to my alter ego here. Um, and let's see if he can share. How do I share? Uh, let's do that. No, 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 that's not what I want. I want this. No, nope. silly me. Let's try again. 
desktop. Yeah. Because who cares about the, um, you know, really cool display, right? Okay. So very, very, very important. So these blocks that you have here, again, before anything else, install GNU Radio, right? So everything here from these blocks are going to be critical for you in, uh, for you to work with GNU Radio and implement the CASAS loop, right? So uh, all these blocks are going to be important because they're all used in the CASAS loop implementation. So definitely you need to include those. Uh, then there's a number of other blocks, like you know matplotlib, mat, numpy, and sys. Well, sys is new, but again, uh, that's used as part of the CASAS loop implementation. So what you want to do is, and I'm going to kill that. What you want to do, first of all, the basic implementation, um, what you want to do with that is um, you, you want to start off with um, trying to implement the um, uh, QPSK modulation. So in lecture 21, I talked about uh, creating signal constellations, right? So pretty much this entire lab is about playing with signal constellations and being able to avoid messy looking signal constellations and getting nice ones instead. So this is how you do it. Um, what happens is, first of all, creating a mapping table. And again, this is all in phase and quadrature representation. So this is the binary pattern 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And I and Q, right? Real is I, imaginary is Q and you plot it. And at the end of the day, what you get is you get that, right? So um, as you can see, this is also the pi over four offset uh, QPSK, right? So that's 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, right? And this is the I domain, the X axis, and Q domain, X, uh, Y axis. So now, that's great. That's awesome. So the next step is uh, you plot that. Now, uh, what that is, that this guy here is just the mapping function of these binary patterns. What's also important is, check this out. I'm using round brackets. So, so it's very different than an, uh, an array. This is, you cannot change the mapping function that we have here, okay? It's immutable or whatever the term is. You can't change it. So now what we do is we generate a random stream of bits. Here we use a, bin a binomial random number generator and we create a matrix. But this matrix, what it does, it's, it's a, thousand, a thousand elements long and it's two elements deep. And what it does is you take those two elements and you say, okay, what's the QPSK symbol? It's this, it's this, in this, using the mapping function. So first of all, the packing changes the binary patterns such that we have now I and Q, okay, components, and then the mapping translates it into the complex numbers that we expect to see up here, right? And spits out, um, yeah, it's not Q, QAM. That's another modulation scheme, but it's QPSK. QAM, it's the same, it's for QAM. Now, this is, you're gonna be reproducing this code over and over and over and over and over and over again. I know I'm saying over a lot. No, but seriously, like I uh, like I'm I'm kind of this is kind of kludgy for me. I would I would recommend that you make a function or something um, out of this because you're going to be calling it a lot all this code. So first of all, um, I arbitrarily added a phase offset here uh, for which is. Like, you know, it's fine. I want to prove a concept here, point, for the basic experimentation of a CASAS loop, okay? And the data, right, here what I did is the following. I did NumPy, okay, complex exponential phase offset. That's fine. This is how we do a phase offset. And we multiply it against the QPSK. I know, QAM, again, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. What am I doing here? So the thing is, I'm not working at passband frequencies, okay? Um, I really wanna drive home the point 
of what the, fa the phase error appears like. And there's no need to do pulse shaping and up conversion and add uh, passband noise to a passband signal. That's not the point of this project. The point of this project is you have some sort of phase rotation, which we can represent all the way down at the complex baseband with I and Q, complex I and Q. And you need to correct for it using the Costas loop. That is the point of this project, okay? So the way we do it is here, that basically is your G of M of T. And I'm now multiplying against G of M of T, another complex exponential, and this has another phase term, okay? And it's represented as a, another complex exponential, E to the J theta, right? And it's constant. In this case, uh, that theta is 0.89. So this here, top block, now we're making calls to GNU Radio. So top block is like, okay, GNU Radio, uh, let's start implementing um, this specific communication block for the Casas loop. So, so we're, we're basically calling the top block model. This is sort of how we initiate a call to GNU Radio, okay? And what we do is here, okay, channels channel underscore model. Again, this is a call to GNU Radio. Okay, what we're asking is we're going to be creating, okay, these channels. So there are two of them, but they're basically the same thing. So basically channel that channel model, we first of all specify the amount of noise because we are putting noise uh, into the communication signal uh, because it would not be fun without noise. So we want some sort of disruption to make it a little bit more difficult in terms of getting the lock. And then there's a frequency offset and there's a time offset. Okay, and that's these two guys here. Now, uh, but the channel, okay, there's no frequency offset, okay, and there's no, and the time offset is one. That's fine, okay? Now, this is what you'll be modifying. Okay, two out of the three. You'll be definitely modifying the bandwidth of the loop filter. So remember what I just said a few minutes ago about the loop filter LPF3? That you're changing, right? And that is the bandwidth. So we, we get you going with this specific bandwidth. And remember this, the DF, the damping factor of the loop filter, we give you 0.5, but you might want to change that around to 0 0.707 or 0 0.8 or 0 0.1. That again is part of the fun of this project. Don't touch M equals four, that just says it's a QPSK signal. And here's a bunch more calls to GNU radio. Okay, let me let me kind of go through it. So digital dot costus loop dot um, digital dot costus loop under uh, costus underscore loop underscore cc. So cc is the C plus plus implementation of the costus loop that we're now making call through Python to. Okay, so we're calling it. So we're creating the costus loop. We're specifying what the loop filter bandwidth is. And we say that we have a modulation scheme that's of order four, right? And now what we do is the, we set for that costus loop, okay? We set the damping factor to be equal to DF, right? Now, sync and sync RX, that's again, the output of the costus loop and the input of the costus loop. So what happens is we define what the input is to the costus loop. So this is the corrupted stuff with the random phase offset. And we have the output of the costus loop, which we hope will be the corrected version of that, right? So now what we do is we also create sync frequency, sync phase, and sync error. So these are additional blocks that we are creating uh, using, again, GNU radio, um, uh, GNU radio modules. And so now what we do is we do the connection. So we have source, right? So now what we do is we have the, the source, the, the source value, um, which uh, in this case, so like uh, this is a vector that's defined here. So that plus the channel and plus the costus loop and then the sync, the sort of where we want to send this. So sync here, again, is the output of the costus loop. So we define the costus loop here. 
we have the channel which introduces the noise and we have the source uh, this is the uncorrupted information and it all goes through this tv.connect module from GNU radio we do the exact same thing here but we do not have the costus loop so this here what the output the sync here would be is when we have a source signal that gets passed through a channel, so now it has noise, and we also know that it has a phase offset, it goes through the Cossus loop and it produces the output signal, which should be the corrected version. Here, if we do not put the Cossus loop, this is what the signal would look like if we do not compensate for its phase, okay? So that's why we're running two signals at the same time. We're running one signal that is compensated by a Cossus loop and one signal that's not compensated. So what we're effectively seeing is when it's not compensated and when the same signal is compensated at the other end of the Cossus loop. And then what we do is we extract out of it, okay, the frequency output, okay, of the Cossus loop, the phase output, and the error. The error is the phase error. So that's gonna be a very important plot that you'll be using a lot of times in this lab, this project, and in order to include in your Jupyter notebook. Um, and then the phase output itself will show like how the phase is rotating and the frequency output. TB run and TB stop just says, like we're setting everything up for the GNU radio implementation. When we run TB run and TB stop means run the thing and then stop the thing, okay? And then what we do is we convert uh, sync.data into an MP array same thing with sync rx dot that. So remember, sync is sync by itself is the output of the Cossus loop. Sync rx is the uncompensated um, uh, uh, before the Cossus loop signal. Okay, and then sync error is the difference of uh, or the, the 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 difference between the two. And what happens is we include a plotting routine here, and what you should see. Okay. What you should see, there are two plots here. So this is what it looks like, okay? Um, so to receive data, okay, and to recover data. Receive data, okay, and to recover data is when you have, um, uh, like, uh, the, 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 like, if you look at, again, like if you go back to the plot, So what's red? So red here, okay, is Rx sig, real imaginary. So we're plotting the IQ, right? This is exactly like how we plot a signal constellation. So what is Rx sig? Rx sig, okay, is based on in sync Rx. Sync Rx is the uncompensated. So red is uncompensated, okay, and blue is compensated. So if we do that, So red is uncompensated, okay? And blue is pi over four QPSK. That's compensated. So the phase lock loop did its thing. Awesome sauce. Now, um, the other figure, which you're gonna be plotting a lot of in this project is this. So this is what I was looking for in terms of the loop convergence. So what happens is this is the Costas loop error convergence. So we start off like, <clears throat> We have to start off somewhere and probably gonna be a very, very huge error, but then quickly the loop locks on. And even though it's going all over the place a little bit, that's fine, that's fine, because there's a lot of noise, right? And what happens is we establish a lock, right? And it's hovering around zero, so zero error, okay? Now, if we now go to the time varying phase, there are three time varying phases. There is linearly increasing time varying phase. So what happens is we start with let's say phase zero, uh, phase value of zero, and vroom, we increase that. And so what happens is we use lin space. So lin space, what that establishes is um, you know like you know I choose a start point, I just choose a start uh, end point for my phase values. And then I take a gajillion points in between and it creates a line value, right? It's constantly increasing, right? And uh, each one is gonna be a phase value. 
that's going to influence the thousand symbols that I'm communicating across. So, so I have the noise, but I also have a phase value that's constantly increasing. So that's my first foray into a time varying phase environment. And I want the Casas loop to lock onto it. The second scenario is where I have a unit step function. So it's a very abrupt phase change. So I start with one phase and then I start with another phase, right? And that's characterized here. So NP append means that I start with a vector uh, yep, of phase values and then suddenly I add a completely different phase values. In this case, it's like, um, it's a very significant, I go from a phase of like minus 0.5 and I go to a phase of 0.5, right? And then lastly is a sign varying, sign varying phase value. So it's constantly changing as a function. And, and so the Casas loop has to track that phase variation, right? And what are you gonna get? Well, what you're going to get is stuff like this, right? So this is the ramp function. So the linearly changing is the ramp function. So again, blue is good. Red is bad. Red is, so you can actually see what happens when it's linearly changing. Uh, what happens to your signal constellation is that when it's linearly changing, your IQ samples actually rotate linearly at a constant rate around, around the XY axis. So it's really cool, right? Um, the, and, and blue shows the recovery, so awesome. You need to choose the loop filter bandwidth and the damping factor in order to achieve that in a nice, elegant way, and then show what the error looks like as well to show effective log. This here is the unit step. And again, makes complete sense what we see here. So we go from one phase value, right, of recovered signal, uh, sorry, receive signal, and then suddenly it jumps to a completely different phase value. Your Casas loop needs to be able to lock onto both. And you can kind of see there are a few spots here and there and everywhere. That probably shows a few of the recovered signals kind of midway between recovering from that sudden jump in phase value. All right? And then last but not least, the sinusoid is when we have like like this thing, right? So the phase is constantly oscillating between one phase value and another. And so what it will do is your, your uh, signal constellation is doing this, is, right? So it's, it's, it's swinging, okay, clockwise and counterclockwise and clockwise and counterclockwise and clockwise and counterclockwise. And your phase lock loop needs to establish lock and bring it to pi over four QPSK, like what we have here in the blue. So that, okay, folks, is the second section, right? So what the best way to do it, again, it's like literally cutting and pasting this code here, okay, from the fourth section, right? But instead, see this phase offset here? So what happens is uh, that phase offset gets replaced by the three phase offset functions that is described in that section. So that's what you need to do. And then the only things that you need to touch are the parameters here. All right? So, and it might sound trivial, but it's, yeah, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to make modifications until it establishes a decent lock. Now, last but not least, mystery signals. So the mystery signals, um, we created several wonky signals, right? Like you don't know if it's sine or linear ramp function or step function or anything like that, okay? So mystery. So you're gonna, you're gonna have to upload this. I provided the command in NumPy uh, in or because these are NumPy uh, uh, files and you write it to mystery signal one, mystery signal two, mystery signal three, and lo and behold, go back to this block here, and it's again, cut and paste. Except that in this case, you don't define that. You don't also, this here, you already are given that. That's what mystery signal one, two, and three are. So, but you don't know what the, what anything about the details here. All you do need to know is that you need to figure out 
Okay, so what is mystery file one? Is it uh, two PSK, so binary PSK? Is it QPSK or is it eight PSK? Now, heads up, eight PSK is really painful, right? Like, uh, like uh, we've been finicking with it. So that's gonna be um, really, really challenging. So we, so totally heads up, that is gonna be a, a, a very difficult signal to extract. But you need to figure out which one of those is. So the best way to do it is again, make a function, insert mystery signal one, mystery signal two, mystery signal three, fiddle with the loop bandwidth, fiddle with the um, dampening factor. Um, and then you could by trial of el by elimination say, oh yeah, this is two PSK, that's two PSK. Hmm, that must be eight PSK, but I would like to see proof. Maybe I put two QPSK signals in just because I'm a nice person. <laughs> so uh, what ends up happening is um, I want proof, right? So, you know, here in no particular order, that's the stuff you might get, right? So if you open it up and just plot it as is, you're going to get something that looks like that. Not good, right? Or you might get this. Right, also not super great. Um, or you might get this, right? They kind of look like, heads up, like they kind of look like QPSK, BPSK, and APSK. I want you to prove it. I want you to show it using the right choices of loop bandwidth and damping factor in order to extract it. So very critical walk away. Your best friend for this project, okay, is gonna be the code starting from here tb gr top underscore block all the way to error equals np array sync dot uh, sync error dot data okay so that block that that's all gnu radio code there's absolutely no real there's no reason for you to fiddle in gnu radio absolutely zero reason for you to fiddle with gnu radio but you you will need to take that that code take the mystery data files as well as the other, the other section, the other data streams, and be able to apply it in order to extract out the appropriate phase correction uh, for these signals. All right. So at the end of the day, I'm going to stop sharing here. At the end of the day, um, what am I looking for? Same thing as every other project, right? So first of all, question one, Plot the scatter plot before and after cost this loop. I want to see it working. You're going to have a mess before. You're going to have beautiful signal constellation points after. And describe why we see what we see. And also plot the phase error. We saw one example of that. Explain what, do you, what are you seeing. And then also play around with different damping factors. How well does it work? Or how well doesn't it work? Um, with the time varying phase, you saw we had three different functions. Uh, basically. Um, uh, was it wash? Uh, no, that's something repeat. But basically, um, this is going to be a repeat of section four for the most part, but for the different non-constant phase varying values, right? And then the mystery files. Um, I want you to find out what those are. I want you to also report what is your choice of loop bandwidth and a damping factor for each case because you're, they're out, they are going to be different and you'll need to specify them uh, which one works how in order to get proof. I want to see signal constellation points for 2PSK, 4PSK, or 2PSK, and 8PSK. All right? So at the end of the day, Jupyter Notebook submission, that's it, that's all. One Jupyter Notebook submission. Make sure you document everything. Make sure it is readable. Have plots as requested because there are point values for each. Okay? And respond to everything. And submit by the deadline. Okay? So the deadline for this project is um, 9 a.m. on Tuesday, December 1st, 2020, okay? So with that, that concludes the overview of project four for ECE 3311.